Welcome to another EduMed video and in this video in the series on cardiac pacing we'll talk about electrical pacing of hearts and this is something that's very poorly understood by many people in intensive care but actually the basics are really quite simple. We'll talk a little bit about the indications of pacing on intensive care, we'll talk about the types of pacing, Please check out my video on pharmacological pacing as I won't go through that in a lot of detail here, but I do in that previous video. Then we'll talk a little bit about transcutaneous pacing, transvenous pacing, touch upon the difference between permanent and temporary wires, although nowadays a lot of people are putting in uh, externalised permanent wires for patients who come in with symptomatic um, bradycardias that aren't from a specific cause like um, poisoning. And then we'll talk a bit about the different ways of putting in transvenous pacing wires. Now, there are many indications for um, pacing a patient, but essentially they boil down to a patient becoming symptomatically bradycardic. That can be because they fall into a complete heart block, and that can be if they've had ischemic heart disease, or they can have poisoning such as digoxin, beta blockers, um, tricyclics, for example. Occasionally, um, we put in pacing wires to overdrive pace someone. This is where there's an intrinsic ability of the heart in some patients, especially those with ischemic heart disease or myocarditis, to de develop malignant ventricular ectopics. And by speeding up the heart rate, what you can do is prevent enough time for those ventricular ectopics to form. Um, and occasionally, if patients have quite significant heart disease with either congestive cardiac failure or patients with outflow tract obstruction, such as critical aortic stenosis, we may need to increase the patient's heart rate in order to maintain an adequate cardiac output. Now, as I went through in the pharmacology talk on cardiac pacing, these are the two equations that I want you to have in your mind at all times. Cardiac output is only dependent on two things. One is the stroke volume, i.e. the amount of blood ejected from the heart with each beat. And the second thing is the heart rate. So even if your heart stays exactly the same and is able to pump the same amount of blood with each pump, or with each beat of the heart, if the heart rate drops, your cardiac output is going to drop. And that's why patients with bradycardias can become quite hypotensive. Because on the wards, what we do is we use blood pressure as a surrogate for cardiac output. And blood pressure is the cardiac output but there's an extra part to it. You have to multiply that by the systemic vascular resistance. So if you've got a patient who's got a falling cardiac output, you might be able to keep the blood pressure up by increasing your systemic vascular resistance. Because you can see here at the equation, if you increase the SVR and keep the cardiac output the same, your blood pressure will go up. And that's the nominally what we do with drugs such as noradrenaline. But you can see how if you've got a normal system and then your cardiac output drops because your heart rate has dropped, by increasing your systemic vascular resistance, you could still maintain a blood pressure. But the problem is, is that the cardiac output has dropped and the perfusion to all of the tissues of the patient has dropped as well. And if that is the case, then you're going to get progressive lactatemias and metabolic acidosis as the patient is essentially in a shock state. And so what we need to do is to try and keep that heart rate at the normal rate for them. And the reason I emphasize the fact that it's normal for them is that a fit, healthy marathon runner will probably have a heart rate of 40. However, if you see the same heart rate of 40 in a patient who's got severe congestive cardiac failure or severe significant aortic stenosis and a fixed cardiac output state, that heart rate probably isn't adequate for them to maintain enough perfusion to all of their tissues and so they may well be shocked. So you've got to think about it from a patient specific perspective. So in terms of the, uh, in terms of the um, sort of typical case that you get, Look back to my pharmacology talk and I talked about a 70-year-old who came in essentially with um, complete heart block, 
who was hypotensive, shocked, and showed evidence of um, biochemical hypoperfusion with a hyperlactatemia acidosis. And also they had a decreased um, conscious level showing that they had inadequate perfusion to the brain. This is a patient who needs quite urgent management to improve their cardiac output and thus improve the tissue perfusion to vital organs such as the brain, kidneys and liver. Now please go back and have a look at my video on the pharmacological management of um, cardiac pacing in intensive care. We go through all of these drugs and also the management of the underlying condition that could be causing the uh, bradycardia. But for the purposes of this talk, we're going to say that all of these drugs have failed. So what's next? Well, the thing that you've probably been taught in um, the ALS course and the BLS, well, and potentially even BLS, is transcutaneous pacing. This is very simply giving electrical stimulations to the heart so that it triggers a beat. The way you do that is you put pads in. So there are two different orientations, well three really. The first is the classic one that you see for patients who have cardiac arrest, which is having one here on the right um, pectoralis and one here in the left sort of axillary region. You can see how that's quite far away from the heart. And so often what I try to do is put an AP, so one on the front and one on the back, so that it's got the shortest distance to get to the heart. For some patients, it's difficult to lift the patient up to put the AP pads on, especially if they've had, for example, trauma, they've got blocks on. Now, of course, with trauma and electrical disturbances, we do things slightly differently. But suffice to say, if you find it difficult to lift that patient up and put them on an AP, the other useful um, pad position that you can use is transthoracic. So putting one here and one here so that it shoots the electricity across like this. But like I say, if you can, always go for an AP. Now, with pacing, in addition to your pads, you also need to have a three lead ECG on. The reason for this is that your machine needs to know when the heart is doing its own intrinsic thing and when you want to give a um, shock and therefore to allow ele additional electrical stimulation. So always remember, if you are pacing, in addition to the pads that you put on, you must also put on the three lead ECG and connect that to your defibrillator. So how do I go about setting up a patient on transcutaneous pacing? So I set my um, heart rate on the uh, machine to 80. And I do that for everyone. 80 is a nice normal number for most patients. Of course, you might need to increase it or decrease it depending upon the patient, ischemia and so on, but start off at 80. And then feel for a pulse peripherally. I tend to go for the radial pulse. However, when you're first starting, it might be easier to try a feeling for the carotid pulse. And the reason is if the patient's very hypotensive with the bradycardia, so in this example, blood pressure of 60, you're unlikely to feel a radial very easily, especially in this sort of situation where you're nervous, your heart's going to be beating hard. You may well be feeling your own pulse. So start with, maybe try the carotid, but if they've got a blood pressure that's not too low, so above 80, you may be able to feel the radial artery and then go with that. And then you increase the output. You start off at zero with the output and you slowly increase it up. Do not worry about electrocuting yourself. This is not the same as um, defibrillating someone. You are not going to electrocute yourself. In fact, even when you're defibrillating someone, the chances of you getting electrocuted are very small. And there are some people um, proposing that we should be continuing CPR whilst shocking patients. Now, we're not there yet, but the key thing is do not worry about electrocuting yourself when you're pacing someone. You, It's not possible. Now, a nice little, trip, uh, little tip 
If the patient's not too shut down, if they're not too adrenergic, if they're not too cool in their peripheries, you can put a SATS probe on and look at the plethysmography trace. So this is the wavy line that you see next to the SATS trace number. And what this shows is each cardiac output, each beat. So you can use it as a surrogate for your heart rate, but also as a surrogate for your um, blood pressure as well. And we'll go through looking at plethysmography traces and arterial line traces in, vid uh, in other videos when talking about the cardiovascular system. But just as a little thing, always try to look at that plethysmography trace. It's a very useful trace and gives you a lot of information, especially if you don't have invasive arterial monitoring for that patient at that point, which you often don't in resus when they initially come in. Now, you want to keep increasing the output until you feel a strong and regular pulse. Be careful. Sometimes when you're just getting to the threshold where the electricity is getting to the heart, it might not be enough to trigger a beat every time. And so when you're around that time where you're getting a strong beat, you might find that every so often it's missing a few. So do go up a little bit further. And so what I tend to suggest is note what the threshold is where you start to get capture, where you start to get that heart rate of 80. So in our example, the patient had a heart rate of 30. If it suddenly starts to jump up to 80 beats per minute, and continuously goes at 80 beats per minute for at least two screens worth or for a minute's worth, then increase the output by another six to eight milliamps over the threshold that you noted. And this is to compensate for increased in electrical impedance. If you imagine shocking a through tissues every 80, every 80 times every minute, over time, the muscles can get quite, uh, the impedance can increase, the muscles can lose some of their electrolytes, the transmission of the electricity can be less. And for all of these reasons, the threshold to actually trigger an electrical stimulation causing a mechanical beat of the heart might increase. And so to compensate for that, set your threshold six to eight above where you're meant to be. This is also important when patients are being moved and stuff, the thoracic impedance might change and as such again you might need that slightly higher amount to be able to maintain electrical and mechanical coupling during pacing. Now what do you do if you're struggling? And it's not uncommon for you to not be able to get good capture or you get capture sometimes and then you lose it. The first thing to do is to try and change the pad orientation. If you've used the traditional um, pad positions for defibrillation, try the AP. If you've got the AP on, try the traditional pad position. And if not that, try the one with um, the biaxilla uh, pad position. When you are changing pads, use new ones. Most packs have single use and they have a special electric coupling gel. Once that gel has been um, exposed to air, once it's been put on the patient, it is not going to be effective for the next time. So always, if you rip that pad off, put a new one on. Patients with hairy chests, always shave their um, chest before you put those pads on. And I'd say even if they're sort of not doing too well, they're quite unstable, you have time just to quickly shave them if you can do it because it'll improve your electrocoupling to the skin much better and also over time what can happen is the pads can work themselves loose if there's hairs underneath there and very occasionally i've seen hairs get burnt as well so for all of those reasons shave the chest if you've got time if you are shaving them do make sure that you dry the skin. Now, very occasionally you find that the electric coupling is not great, and you find this often with patients who use a lot of body moisturizer. What I would suggest is clean the skin with some um, alcohol wipes, which will get rid of the oils, but make sure that alcohol has completely dried. And what I tend to do is take a saline swab, wipe everything down, then take some dry gauze, wipe things down again and then stick the pads on.
if there's any alcohol there, you can potentially cause burns. But sometimes that um, the moisturizers that people put on their bodies might not allow the pads to stick on properly or allow them to fall off after a period of time. Now, one question that people often ask is about sedation during transcutaneous pacing. You do need to sedate them after a point because it can be quite uncomfortable to constantly be shocked otherwise. But you need a lot less than people think. So up until 20 milliamps, patients don't often feel anything at all. And the reason I put that in is it's way more important to get those pads on, to get good electrocoupling, and then to turn up to 20 whilst you're getting someone to come down to give you a bit of sedation, be that the intensive care doctor or an anaesthetist. From 20 to 30 milliamps, it feels a little strange. And really, it's above 40 that they start to become uncomfortable. And it's above 60 that you really need to think about giving them some analgesia or sedation. So what can you use for sedation? Well, the first thing is pain is the main thing that you want to get rid of. Don't forget paracetamol. Often these patients can do really well with just some paracetamol. So rather than having to give them lots of opiates, giving them that paracetamol can take the edge off and allow you to get all the way up to 40 milliamps before you even need to give anything. Less is more, as with everything in intensive care. The less that you do to a patient, the better it is. But if you are going to give something, there's a variety of things that you can use. Some people use midazolam. It's often very difficult to use sedative agents in these patients because what you find is that they're slightly obtunded when they come in with the low cardiac output state and then they slowly wake up more and more and then they can become agitated as they get perfusion back to their brain before then coming back to being normal. And if you're using something slightly longer acting like midazolam, what can happen is that patients can become very agitated, you give them a big bolus of midazolam, and then you render them completely unconscious for when the sort of hyperemia which caused them to be agitated subsides. Um, if I have to, sometimes I use propofol, and when I do use propofol, I've moved away from giving boluses, and what I would start is an infusion and titrate that to the patient's level of consciousness. The great thing about this is it's short acting and as such it'll um, if you do need to if the patient becomes agitated you can give a bit more and then if they become less agitated you can reduce down the rate again. But I tend to use this as an infusion not as boluses because again with boluses patients can become quite um, obtunded and propofol you can lose your laryngeal reflexes and you can also um, become apneic if you give large enough doses so be careful with it and especially with all of these drugs in poor cardiac output states it takes a while between the injection that you give through your IV cannula getting to the brain and so if you give them too quick in succession the boluses you may well find that this patient suddenly gets a big hit of some kind of anesthetic agent or amnesic and then they become obtunded very quickly my preference is ketamine. I, I tend to like this. And the reason is that it's got good analgesic effects. It's a sedative, but it maintains your laryngeal reflexes. It maintains your ventilatory ability as well. And it gives you some dissociation. In addition to that, because of its sympathetic action, it may even help a little bit with trying to maximize the adrenaline or adrenaline um, f release from the sympathetic system. For all of these things, ketamine is quite nice. And what I tend to do is to give 10 milligram boluses up to about 50 milligrams as analgesic. Above 50, you're starting to go into the sedative um, realms of ketamine. Some people mix this with midazolam or other benzodiazepines. I tend to try it, use it quite cleanly. If I'm failing with ketamine, I move on to propofol and I'd have a and personally have a very low threshold for intubating these patients, taking over their ventilation and their um their oxygenation just to allow other things to happen afterwards, such as putting in transvenous pacing. Because transcutaneous pacing is always a temporary measure. So once you've got them stabilised on transcutaneous pacing, or if you can't get them to capture at all on transcutaneous pacing, and sometimes we can't, 
then we need to think about something else. And the gold standard is transvenous pacing. There are a number of benefits to transvenous pacing. The first is that it's so much more comfortable for the patient. Rather than using the big electrical current to try and generate an electrical signal in the heart, you can pass a small wire through one of the central veins and into the um, heart itself and then stimulate the heart directly with a very small probe and therefore very small currents. You get better electromechanical coupling. What does that mean? Well, for each electrical beat of the heart, you need to translate that into ventricular contraction. Certainly with transvenous pacing, because it's more reliable in the electricity that it's delivering to the cardiac muscle, you get much more reliable contractions of the heart. Whereas with um, transcutaneous pacing, it's a lot less reliable that the electricity that you're providing goes through all of the skin, the tissue, the lung tissue, before it hits the uh, myocardium itself. Also, because you've got much less for space for the electricity to go through, because the probe is sitting in the heart, sitting next to the ventricle itself, you need a lot less current and therefore you get less electrical damage, not just to the heart, but to the tissues around as well. Because the wires are sitting in the vein, it's also much more stable. The patient's less likely to have a lead knocked off or to for the pads to come off and therefore it's much safer to transfer a patient once they've got transvenous pacing on board. And these patients don't fail as often. It's not uncommon for patients to capture initially with transcutaneous pacing but very slowly the impedance increases uh, or the pads themselves start to fail and then you lose that electromechanical coupling and therefore the heart rate starts to drop again. It does have some disadvantages, however. It's invasive. Putting one in can be difficult, especially if patients are agitated, hypoxic, obtunded. Um, you can introduce air emboli, as with any central line. You can cause damage to the heart. Don't forget you're putting wires into the heart, and so there is a risk of perforating the heart, especially those patients who are, have significant cardiomyopathies, be they ischemic or myocarditic. And if they've got thin ventricles, all it can sometimes take is a small amount of pressure to actually just rupture that myocardium. There's also a significant infection risk. I don't generally like temporary pacing wires being in for more than a few days. Generally speaking, we should have treated the underlying condition by then, and the risk of infection goes up exponentially with trans, um, transvenous pacing wires. A lot of um, centres are moving towards using permanent um, pacing wires, which they put in, which the cardiologists put in, and then you put it onto an externalised box, and then once things have settled down, once sepsis has improved, then they can tunnel the, um, and make a pocket for the actual generator itself. These have much lower rates of infection compared to the traditional transvenous pacing through an internal jugular or femoral vein. People argue that it's difficult to place, but actually what you'll see as you go through this, and hopefully you'll get to practice some, is that it's really not that difficult to place these. And depending upon the type of transvenous pacing wire that you're putting in, especially the balloon tipped ones, are so easy. So, there are different types of trans transvenous sorry, pacing wires. So in terms of the transvenous ones, so not transcutaneous, this is this should be transvenous. There's the balloon tip, and that's commonly what you'll probably see in A and Eth. And the benefit of that is you don't need fluoroscopy to place them. Soft nose, which is often the ones that we will put in temporarily. Screw tip, and these are ones that have a little screw on the end of the tip of the pacing wire that essentially bores into the myocardium anchors it in place and as such doesn't fall out and that's usually what they use for more permanent systems that the cardiologists put in. And then pacing swans. These aren't that common in the UK but we certainly do have them. 
they are fantastic and probably my favorite because not only does it provide you with a pacing wire but it also allows you to have some lumens to give other medications such as noradrenaline and um, medications to treat the underlying condition whatever that might be but what you're seeing here is what most pacing wires look like and what they have are two electrodes a positive and a negative and a wire that allow and a port that allows you to um, enter into the vein itself it's put in with a seldinger technique and please go and have a look at my videos on how to place central lines because it'll explain exactly what a seldinger technique is and putting in a temporary pacing wire the first bit is basically the same as putting in a central line this particular example has a balloon tip in um, and it's got what we call an atraumatic tip. You can see how long this is, and it has little depth markers. So you have usually two lines at 10 centimeters, three lines at um, 15 centimeters, four lines at 20 centimeters, and so on. This is really important because it gives you an idea of how far in the um, wire has gone, and you don't want to blow up any balloons too high up because then you'll blow it up in the vein and it could cause rupture of the vein similarly you don't want too much of the wire to go in because what can happen is it can coil up in the ventricle tie itself in a knot and then you're going to need cardiac surgery to actually remove that pacing wire so always make sure you don't put too much of the pacing wire in and i would generally suggest be very careful if you're putting in more than 25 to 30 centimeters In terms of pacing a um, transvenous pacing wire, what you get is usually an introducer set. And this is what it looks like when it comes in the pack. And you have to deconstruct it. So you can see here there's a wire. So the wire comes out. There is a dilator. So this is the wire. This is the dilator. And this is the actual what we call cordis catheter. So when you put it in, what you want to do is you want to load it up so that you put this dilator through the catheter so that it's sticking out. You use a needle to puncture the vein and you pass the wire through it and then you load the wire onto the dilator which is loaded onto the cordis catheter and you pass the whole lot into the vein itself. You can then take the, inch, the dilator out there's a valve here to stop blood from spilling out and there's a port here to allow you to give saline or other drugs as you need to which will come out of this cordis catheter as well and then when you're placing the actual pacing wire it you push it through this valve and it'll go through and come out of here in this uh, in superior vena cava which is usually where you put it and usually you use the right internal jugular If you're using a non-balloon tipped or a non-pacing swan, what you want to try and do is use fluoroscopy. I would not put in um, pacing wires that aren't balloon or pacing swan uh, pacing wires without fluoroscopy. There's a few things that you need to know, however, with putting these in. One is that you may need to take the pads off, especially if you've got an AP positioning of the pads. And that's why sometimes using the axillary, by axillary, so on either side of the chest, is useful because you can continue pacing the patient whilst putting in the pacing wire. However, if you've got an AP um, positioning of the wires or even the traditional positioning of the um, pacing pads for transcutaneous pacing you'll have to stop transcutaneous pacing whilst putting in these transvenous wires so that's why sometimes it's worth putting in putting them by axial by um, axillary the other important thing that people forget is you can't do this on a normal bed so if you've got a patient who's um, bradycardic you've got them on pacing you have to also transfer them onto an x-ray um, compatible bed because you're going to need to do fluoroscopy in order to see exactly where the uh, wires are and that requires a C-arm. 
Now, this x-ray here is um, actually one for a traditional pacing wire, which you can see an atrial lead and a ventricular lead. Forget about the atrial lead. The pattern that you want to see when you put in a pacing wire is the wire goes down the superior vena cava into the right atrium through the um, tricuspid valve and it'll come and it'll sit in the apex of the heart. You can see here the outline of the heart and it's just sitting here in the apex. This is the pattern that I want you to see. If you see the wire going down here, then it's missed the right atrium and it's going down into the inferior vena cava. If it's going in and then it starts to curl up, again, be careful, gently pull that back because what you don't want is for it to all coil up and then to have a knot form in it, which you can't then take out. But this is the perfect position, sitting right at the apex of the ventricle. And then the other side of it, you um, connect up to the chip pulse generator, and I'll show you some of those in the next few slides. So, if you are putting in the soft nosed transvenous pacing, so this is the one without a balloon, you must use fluoroscopy. You can see that it's got a bit of a curve to it, and can you see here how it's got a bit of a curve? You can use this to your advantage to put the um, wire into the heart and direct it so that it goes into the right atrium and then into the ventricle. And the way to do it is you want this curve always pointing towards the apex of the heart. So whether you're going, so when you're going in on the right hand side in the right internal jugular, aim it so that the curve is pointing towards the left side of the patient. And by doing so, it'll just slip really easily and you'll be surprised how easy it is to place it and to get it to cannulate the right atrial, um, uh, right atrium, go down through the tricuspid valve and into the right ventricle. These two bits are where you connect up your electrodes to the pulse generating box and then you can start pacing the patient. I tend to grip it with my thumb and forefinger and then use gentle rotations of the um, wire itself when you're roughly near where the right atrium is to get it in there. Don't do big movements and often all it needs is just a little gentle movement and if anyone's put in central lines and put in a wire to, as part of the Seldinger technique, you'll know it's so easy to actually get into the right ventricle, which is when you see all the ectopics start to form. So you don't, it doesn't take a lot of skill to actually get it in there. One thing I would say, and really important to emphasize, is that you can perforate the heart, especially myocarditic patients or those with ischemic cardiomyopathies where the ventral, ventricular wall can be thin. It doesn't take a lot of pressure to actually perforate it, so be really gentle with your movements. Be very smooth with your movements. If you feel anything catching, stop, pull back and readjust. The balloons are slightly different. So with a balloon, it's the same sort of line. It's use the same introducer, but the difference is there's a little balloon here to help float you into the right place. So with a rigid um, pacing wire, you need fluoroscopy to see exactly where you're going. Whereas with this, the hope is that the balloon inflates and slowly guides you through the direction of flow of blood, which will be from the superior vena cava into the right atrium, into the right ventricle, and then hopefully when you deflate the balloon, you can then direct it into the ventricular apex. In terms of placing it, a few little tips. Pass the wire at least 20 centimeters before um, inflating the balloon. So this is to the double bar, if you remember to those markings that you see, it's usually the two um, thick black lines, which is 20 centimeters. The reason for not inflating the balloon before that is you may still be in the cordis catheter bit, so you may not have come out of the catheter, or you may be inflating it in either the internal jugular or the superior vena cava 
and causing an occlusion or potentially even perforation. Use only a small amount of um, gas to expand this and we use air to float it, not water. The reason for air is that it will float the wire, similar to that if, if you're putting in a, a swan Gans catheter. Now you must also be um, careful when you're um, putting these in that if it's difficult to pass the wire through then you try, must use a bit of saline which you can run slowly through the side port to help guide the tip in. By having a continuous flush of saline going through you'll find that it's easier to direct your balloon into the right direction. Once you've got to 20 centimeters and you've blown up the balloon Connect up your um, pulse generator to the other parts of the swan, the two electrodes, and set your milliamperage to 10 milliamps. Then you can see what's happening. If you've got no twitch, you're probably still in the superior vena cava, or you're in the heart, but you're not quite hitting the ventricle yet. If you've got arm twitches, and the, and the arm uh, in the neck or the arm, what this indicates is that the pacing wire has gone down and gone into the subclavian vein. If, however, you see that the pacing the diaphragm, so you see abnormal abdominal movements, you might be pacing the diaphragm, in which case you've gone past the right atrium and into the inferior vena cava. So if you find that, pull back the... Um, the catheter a little bit and then re-advance. Uh, Once you get me electrical capture, stop. So if you start pacing at 80 beats per minute, you need to then stop. And then you need to either feel for a pulse or look at the arterial waveform. And you must make sure that you're getting a good capture. And a good capture is if you get needing less than 2 milliamps in order to get a good strong beat of the heart. So one-to-one -one electrical and mechanical capture of the heart at less than two milliamps. If it's more than two milliamps, you may need to redirect the wire a little bit so it's sitting in a different part of the ventricle because that part of the ventricle may be ischemic, uh, may be fibrotic after ischemic heart disease and uh, say a myocardial infarction. Or it might just be flopping away a little bit from the uh, ventricular wall. And so try and get it to seat really nicely. Always double the threshold. If you find that they don't need a lot of electricity at all to cause a contraction, so less than 1 milliamp, set a minimum of 2.5 milliamps. Because what you will find is that over time, the heart itself, the patch of myocardium which has been continuously stimulated, becomes more resistant to the electrical stimulation and as such will need higher and higher milliamperage to actually give a mechanical capture. Now the pacing boxes itself, there's a wide variety of different pacing boxes that you'll see. The vast majority of them for temporary pacing will be just pure ventricular pacing boxes and that's what you're seeing here. There are more complicated um, dual chamber pacing boxes and if you're interested leave a comment in the section below. If you want I can do a, sec do a video looking at all the different pacing boxes and how to set them. But for simplicity's sake this is the most common type of pacing box that you see and there's only a few different settings here. The first setting is to switch it on and off and most of these have a are off and then what we call VVI and VVI is what you should set all patients on when you're first starting them with temporary transvenous pacing. You might then change it to other settings depending upon what you want for the patient and the patient's condition but at the start set it to just VVI. Now there's a few other settings. So the first setting is this one here and that is the rate. Now you can see here it's currently set at 60. You can change it up to 80 and what I'd suggest is when you first start pacing patients put it at 80 beat 
It's permanent. This is the sensitivity. Now, what the sensitivity is saying is it's going to constantly monitor the heart. If the heart has its own intrinsic heartbeat, it doesn't want to give a electrical stimulation. It will allow the heart to do its own thing. So, you can see here, this is 20 and this is 1. Let's say you've turned it all the way over to 1. So now you just need a one millivolt electrical activity and that'll tell the pacing box that there is an intrinsic heart rate. Now that one millivolt may just be movement of the patient's muscles, but it'll think, oh, it's the heart has got an intrinsic rate, therefore I'm not going to provide a heartbeat. So if you send the sensitivity too low, so a very small millivoltage will cause the pay, the box to think that it's um, got an underlying rhythm, then it's just not going to pace at all. Similarly, if you set the sensitivity dial way too high, what you'll find is that irrespective of what the underlying rhythm is, the pacing box is just going to keep pacing because it's not going to detect the underlying rhythm. So you want to try and set it at a normal sensitivity and generally speaking between three and five is where you t generally set these patients and then you can adjust it depending upon the patient's intrinsic um, millivoltage for their intrinsic cardiac rate and what you'll see here is a sensing indicator and this will flash every time that the um, patient is having an intrinsic and the final thing is the stimulation. And this is where you want to um, see how much electricity, how many volts it takes to actually get the patient to have an intrinsic, sorry, an um, a, a electrical mechanical coupling beat. So you set this initially at 10. And then you slowly, once you've got capture and you've got a good heartbeat, you want to slowly reduce this um, voltage down until you get to a point where you stop getting a beat. You might get electrical rhythm on the ECG, but you don't get the bump on the arterial line trace, or you don't feel the pulse running at 80 beats per minute. And by dropping this down slowly, you will get to what we call the threshold voltage. This is the amount of electricity it actually takes for the pacing wire to produce a um, mechanical beat of the heart. And that is the threshold which you then double to give you the setting that you keep the patient at. Now with pacing boxes, you'll hear lots of different nomenclature and I'll go through um, pacing boxes in more detail if you'd like, but it's worth just keeping in um, mind this nomenclature because it gives you an idea of what that VVI talks about. So the way to think about this is the first letter is the chamber that's paced. So we talk about V, VVI. So the first V means that you're pacing the ventricle. You know that's right because we've passed a pacing wire down and into the ventricle. So that's what's going to be paced. So it's going into the ventricle. The second uh, letter stands for the chamber that's sensed. Now again, we only have one wire and it's sitting in the ventricle. So what we'll be sensing is the ventricle as well. So any electrical activity in that ventricle, it'll sense and think, oh, that's a QRS complex. So that's the VVI, VV. And then the third talks about what happens if it senses something. So in VVI, it'll pace the ventricle It'll have a look to see whether there's any intrinsic rhythm within the ventricle. And if there is intrinsic rhythm in the ventricle, the eye means that it'll say, oh, hang on, the heart's got its own intrinsic um, beat here, so I'm not going to give a paced rhythm just for that one beat. And then I'll monitor again. And if the next beat has dropped, I'll start pacing again. So that's what VVI stands for. So it'll be ventricular paced, ventricular sensed and if it senses um, a electrical activity it'll inhibit 
itself and not give the pacing spike that it would normally otherwise give. Pacing swamps are really helpful pieces of kit if patients are quite unstable, if you need to monitor cardiac output status, or if you want to um, put in these temporary wires but you don't have a balloon tip uh, pacing wire. It works in exactly the same way and when we go through central venous access um, types of equipment that we have, I'll go through uh, swan GANS catheters in a bit more uh, detail. However, essentially what swan GANS catheters do is it's a very long central line and you float it down through the right atrium into the right ventricle up through the right ventricular outflow tract and into the pulmonary artery. So this is where what we call PA catheters and this is how we get wedge pressures and monitor the right and the left sided heart pressures. Now, if you have a look at this, you can see it flips up through the right ventricle and up into the um, pulmonary arteries. Now there is a port here with a pacing swan catheter where if you pass a, a pacing wire down, it'll pretty much direct it exactly into the apex of the right ventricle and allow for you to get a pacing uh, wire there and allow for transvenous pacing. If you're interested, I can go through this in a huge amount of detail about exactly how to place a pacing wire through a pacing swan kit. Um, but suffice to say, it's actually really easy and there's a little bit of pulling back and forth that you need to do in order to get it into the right position and looking at pressure waves. So like I say, if you're interested, let me know and I can always produce a video on that. So it's all well and good knowing how to do these things, but the, uh, the more important thing in intensive care is knowing when to troubleshoot these things. And I think it's almost a universal fact that when things go wrong, they always go wrong at night, and it's when all the experienced doctors and nurses aren't around to give you a hand. So the typical scenario is you're the ITU reg overnight, the nurse calls you over and says, oh, the pacemaker doesn't seem to be working properly. You look at your handover sheet, oh God, this patient is a complete heart block chap who wasn't c capturing on transcutaneous pacing. What do you do? So this is, um, how you should really approach these sorts of patients and it's not uncommon to get this. So the first thing you want to do is to get a 12 lead ECG. Now I know people roll their eyes and think oh you know 12 lead ECG why? Well there's a number of useful things you want to look out for. First are they actually pacing? Sometimes the monitors on the screen on the patient's bedside aren't that accurate. A 12 lead ECG will give you a good idea of whether you're still getting pacing spikes. And also, if you're not pacing, see what the underlying rhythm is. Just because they came in with complete heart block, you may have improved them from a biochemical perspective. You may have reperfused them with coronary angioplasties or with stents. And as such, the patient may be in a better state from their intrinsic system. So you may not actually need to do anything with the pacing at all. Then take a very systematic look at the pacing system itself. Look at the um, placement of the uh, of the leads. So use a chest x-ray, look at the chest x-ray after it's put in, and you'll be surprised how often leads have moved and people haven't noticed. But also it's useful to see, um, to get a repeat chest x-ray because things may have moved since the last one. If you're trained in echocardiography, probably the easiest thing to do, and what I tend to do is just pop a probe on and have a look to see where that um, pacing wire is and see whether it's still sitting in the um, uh, right ventricular apex. Check the polarity. Sometimes the leads have come off and people have put them the wrong way round or they've changed the pacing box during the day and accidentally put the leads around the wrong way around. Always check, swap them around just to see. Oops. Now, check if the connections are on tight. You often find that these connections can get loose or people who didn't know how to screw on the connections to tighten them 
haven't done it properly and as such they all fall apart and it's not that uncommon even in cardiac theatres the number of times I've forgotten to screw on the thing the pacing box properly and so the pacing box has fallen off and the epicardial wires stop pacing and we we're all in a panic and I realise it's my fault that I haven't screwed them on properly so check all those connections Depending on the pacing box that you have, check to see whether it's set to atrial or ventricular. That can make a difference in terms of the programming internally and also the type of pacing that it does. The battery is one of the banes of my life. It's not uncommon for batteries to run out and um, usually there's a LED that shows a low battery. But a lot of them, if, there's, if the battery is starting to run out, that becomes very dim and you can't even see it. So if in doubt, change your batteries. There must always be spare batteries at the bedside and most units have a spare um, pacing box on the unit just in case anything happens to uh, one of the pace pacing boxes attached to a patient. I say that but quite often you find that um, there's a big rush to get into cardiac theatres to find a spare pacing box or to into the cardiac recovery. Then check your settings. These should be documented on the ward round every single time. What the threshold pressure, threshold um, voltage was, what the rate was, and what the sensing um, millivoltage was. And if then if they've been changed, then change them back to what they were. And if they haven't changed, then think about the box. Do you need to change it? Maybe it's a failure intrinsically of the box itself. Check the mode. If you're ever in doubt with temporary pacing wise, put it into VVI. VVI means ventricle is paced, the ventricle is being sensed, and if the vent if it sees a intrinsic um, electrical activity of the heart, it'll inhibit itself from giving the ventricular pacing. As a general guide in your head your sensitivity should be between two and five millivolts now of course that changes depending upon the patient but if it's outside of those values always ask yourself the question has it been set correctly but two and five is about right that can change with patient position less so with a temporary wires that are transvenously placed but as with any line it can always get dislodged think about output failure. So this could be patients don't have any, pa they don't get the electromechanical coupling and it could be because there's no pacing spikes because the whole box has failed. It could be because there's lead malfunction. So it's not, even though the box itself is working fine, there's been a crack or a pull or a tear in the wire itself leading to the electrodes. There could be an unstable connection. If the connection itself is broken, and a lot of them you'll see they'll be chipped and broken, or if the wire hasn't been pushed properly into the pacing box, it could intermittently be cutting out. The battery could be dying. Really important, check for oversensing. What does that mean? Well, what it means is that the pacing box is seeing small electrical activity and thinking, oh, hang on, that's the intrinsic rate of the heart I'm not going to pace. So if you're ever in doubt, you can increase up the threshold for sensing the intrinsic electrical activity of the heart and just make sure it's not stopping itself from pacing unnecessarily because the sensitivity is too, um, too much. In terms of how to treat it, check the connections, change the battery. I tend to just change the box, um, have a look at the leads, change the leads if they need to. Increase your output to maximum, so to 25 milliamps, and then you can work your way down as you need to. Especially if the lead has moved a bit, you might find that those high voltages, it is working and gives you some time to readjust the position of the wire or call for someone to do that for you. If you're really in trouble and you find that a patient is um, not pacing, but you think that the box is working okay and you think it may be a problem with oversensing, you can change them to VOO. What does that mean? That means it paces the ventricle. O means it's not sensing anything, and so it's 
purely just going to stimulate the ventricle at a rate that you've told it at a millivoltage, uh, at, a, um, at an output milliamperage that you've told it. it. doesn't care about anything else. You've got to be really careful when doing that, and we'll go through the so-called RMT phenomenon in the next few slides. So that's a failure of output. But what about a failure of capture? What does that mean? So you're not, so now you're seeing the pacing spikes. Before with a failure of output, you don't see any spikes. But now you're seeing the spikes on the ECG and with the, um, uh, with the monitor. But what you're getting is you're not getting either a QRS complex or you're getting a QRS complex, but you're not getting electromechanical coupling. You're not getting the arterial line bump. There isn't a beat associated with that pacing spike. Usually it's because the wire is displaced or the output is too low. I talked about the fact that as time goes on, myocardium can become fibrosed. It can get a bit too acclimatized to that electrical activity. And so it needs a higher amount of electricity, i.e. the threshold is increased. Or sometimes we see it if the cable's not on the correct port and if the wires have fallen out and the nurse has hastily pushed it back in, it may be that they've put it the wrong way round or it's not been put in correctly. Always, always when you're managing a patient, any cardiac patient, make sure that electrical abnormalities are appropriately treated. Hyperkalemia, hypokalemia, Hypo or hypomagnesemia and hypocalcemia can all cause um, pacing not to actually work well and to not get good electromechanical coupling. So always treat those. Generally speaking, I ask for a potassium between 4.5 and 5 millimoles per litre, a magnesium above 1.2 millimoles per litre, and an ionised calcium at least of 1.1 or above millimoles per litre. Don't forget that these patients can have MIs. So you may have a secondary pathology that's causing the patient not to capture now. And it's not uncommon for patients to have myocardial infarctions and that can cause them to lose output. Then it's another really important reason for getting that 12 lead ECG. Also, some drugs can cause it. And things like beta blockers, lidocaine, verapamil, especially if we're starting to reintroduce some of those things, or they've been given accidentally can cause these problems. So always think about drugs and pair back the drugs and anything that's negatively chronotropic. Oversensing. This is where the um, pacing box itself thinks that it's getting an intrin there's an intrinsic QRS complex. And so it says, oh, I'm not going to um, give a electrical signal. I'm not going to pace. So you get inappropriate inhibition. It's not always relating to the uh, amount of milliamp millivoltage that you've set the uh, sensitivity at. Sometimes it's a problem with the actual intrinsic QRS complex. So patients with large P waves, large T waves, a lot of skeletal muscle movement or contact problems can all cause this. And going back to this uh, with the large T waves especially, Hyperkalemia is really important because it can cause quite significant T waves and make it look like there's multiple um, QRS complexes, where in reality it's just large T waves next to normal QRS complexes. So always treat hyperkalemia. Do not let patients who have transvenous pacing become significantly hyperkalemic. And I would suggest above six millimoles per liter is something that you should definitely actively manage some even uh, above 5.5. If you do have it, there are a couple of things you can do. It might be because you've got such a high pacing output that you're actually stimulating pectoral muscles or rectus sheath muscles through the diaphragm or through the chest wall. And if that is the case, and if the threshold allows it, you can drop down the pacing output and you might be able to get rid of some of that extrinsic electrical activity that the pacing box itself is seeing.
you can increase the absolute sensitivity, make it harder to inhibit a, um, a pacing spike. And again, you can change them over to what we call VOO. That's where you pace the ventricle, you're not sensing anything, and therefore it's just purely going to keep pacing the ventricle, irrespective of what the intrinsic heart rhythm is doing. And again, that can cause trouble, and we'll go on to that next. So, what happens if the vent if the pacing box just keeps giving a pacing spike doesn't care what's going on with the int intrinsic electrical activity of the heart well you can get something called an r on t phenomenon what does that mean that means if you've had an intrinsic beat the between the q and the r and the t wave you're getting repolarization and if you get a second electrical spike or stimulation during that QT interval, you can get so-called R on T phenomenon. What that does is if you've got repolarization, so some of the cells are repolarizing, others are back to being able to be stimulated, and you stimulate the heart, you can cause multiple ventricular rhythms all over the heart, so you can either cause what we call ventricular tachycardia, which you're seeing here, or you can cause ventricular fibrillation. And it's because you're not going to go down the normal cardiac pathways for the beat of a heart, but instead some areas of the heart have repolarized, other areas haven't, and so different bits are going to be able to fire off at different parts. So you're going to get disordered beating of the heart, and potentially VT or VF. So in terms of final tips, what do I do every day when I start a ward round, when I start on my night shifts, back when I used to do night shifts, I always check the last chest x-ray when I do my evening review. And I ask myself the specific question, are the leads in the right place? I check the box leads and the connecting leads to the pacing wires it's physically myself when I examine the patient. I will physically check the threshold at the start of every one of my shifts. What that means is I slowly decrease the, th um, the output of the pacing box until you lose capture. I make a note of what that threshold is and then I increase, double it back up to where it was or double it of beyond what the threshold is. And the reason for doing that is if you see that the threshold is wildly different, it's increased massively from the last time, it might be that the um, wires have changed position. And if they've changed position, get another chest x-ray. And then you might need to reposition. Check the underlying rhythm. It's really important. Sometimes we find that patients are on temporary pacing wires at a heart rate of 90. You bring down the threshold to check their threshold voltage and actually they've got an intrinsic heart rate and it's just running at 70 or 60. So it's just been inhibited by constantly being paced by the pacing box. And where possible, always try to use their intrinsic rhythm, especially if they're in sinus rhythm. Atrial kick adds about 20 to 30 percent of the cardiac output of each stroke volume and therefore if you reduce if you have a patient who's just ventricular pacing you're automatically reducing their stroke volume if you compare it to them who are in sinus rhythm where you've got the atrial kick giving that additional amount of blood coming into the ventricle which then allows a higher stroke volume it's also useful just to check their cardiac output at differing heart rates at 70, 80 and 90 is what I generally look at. These are still within physiological levels and not so high that it's causing a large myocardial oxygen demand. If you find that patients are very dependent on a fast heart rate, what it's indicating is that the cardiac output is probably not uh, adequate in terms of their stroke volume. And you need to question how can you optimize their stroke volume. That might be inotropy or Commonly, what happens is that they're intravascularly deplete. So if you find that the patient really does depend on that 90 heart rate, consider assessing their fluid status. 
I personally will do a transthoracic echo and have a look to see how full or empty the patient looks. Maybe do things like VTI assessments and so on. But essentially you want to see whether the patient needs a bit of fluid and sometimes all they need is a bit of fluid and you can bring their heart rate down to 70 or 80. The overarching thing that I want you to take away from this talk is don't be scared of transvenous pacing, but if transvenous pacing fails for whatever reason, and we talked about some of those before, transcutaneously pace the patient. You cannot go wrong. If you find that the transvenous pacing isn't working exactly how you need it, the patient is becoming unstable, always revert to transcutaneous pacing. It'll buy you some time until you can then sort things out at a later date with um, a cardiologist or the intensive care consultant being able to fiddle with things. I hope that's been useful and if you have then um, please like and subscribe to the channel. There'll be a lot more videos coming out. I'd also really recommend if you do want those additional um, presentations like for example how to place a pacing swan into a patient um, put it in the comments below and I'll happily try and make that video for you as soon as possible.